Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 60 of Concerts at Home. My name is Adrian Spence. I'm the Artistic Director for Camerata Pacifica. We got a great program for you today. Um, we're going to finish with the, the release of a new video with Gilles von Saddle playing the Appassionata Sonata of Beethoven. And that was a COVID project for us. We recorded him in uh, June at Thayer Hall at the Colburn School. And we were experimenting with camera techniques and, and lighting. And the first piece, so the, the first two pieces, we're going to play two pieces of solo violin music that are going to contrast amazingly. And the first piece is by Jakob Chupinski. It's called um, Wreck of the Umbria. And uh, this, this, in terms of lighting, the lighting designer we worked with, there was a, a chap called Jared Sayeg, and this is amazing. Uh, it's Kristen Lee is playing the piece. And we recorded this in June 19th. And the, the Umbria was an Italian ship that was sunk by the British Navy almost immediately after Italy's entrance into the Second World War. And Jakob is a scuba diver and he came across the wreck. And this is, this is a musical depiction of um, his underwater experience. Uh, so it, 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 if it feels a little submarine to you, yeah, you're right on. It was commissioned by Anna Kiko Myers. And, but Jakob is friends with Kristen. So he approached Kristen and it, this is a piece for, for violin and electronics. And he approached Kristen and it was Kristen that recorded. So what happened was Jakob recorded Kristen playing her violin and then he, he took these samples and manipulated them mightily. So um, the, the accompaniment, the electronic part of the, of the piece is all Kristen, although you won't recognize uh, much of it as violin sound. Um, so here we have Kristen Lee playing with Kristen Lee, which is rather fabulous. So um, yeah, so uh, the first piece we have, Jakob Chapinski's Wreck of the Umbria, and then we'll go straight into another solo violin piece, completely different. Um, and this is, this we, uh, is recorded from performance September 18th, 2015 with Paul Huang. And it's a size solo sonata number three in D minor, opus uh, 27. And um, this was one of six sonatas that the virtuoso Eugene Asai wrote for uh, each dedicated to another prominent uh, violinist. And this one is dedicated to Georges Enescu. And this is a standard, uh, standard is not the word, beyond standard uh, uh, composition to, to explore the, the virtuoso techniques of violin playing. So those are the first two pieces of the program. And then we'll come back and Gilles is going to join us and tell us a little bit about the Apasionata.
Ladies and gentlemen, the last piece on our program today is Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata with our principal pianist, Gilles von Saddle. Now, when I last recorded Zoom interviews, uh, the, the video would bounce back automatically between uh, the person who was speaking, and that didn't happen this time. So Gilles is going to be front and center most of the, the time with, with my voice in the background, but better to look at Gilles' face than mine. Mr. Gilles von Saddle. Gilles, welcome. Thank you. Nice this is you. episode 60 of Concerts at Home. And I didn't, uh, 
There wasn't ever an intention to pick this up again, but here we are. But you're in Seattle. I am. Yeah, on your playing for people. Are you? You're, I presume you're playing for people. Yes. Yeah. It's one of these mixed streamed and uh, I think distanced audience, and we have to wear masks again here, which uh, I haven't done in a while <laughs> on the stage. So it's. Uh, is that is that a is that a state city requirement or is that a? You know, I this point I, uh, I don't pay. I just do what okay. I'm told, and I stop paying attention to the technicalities. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And are you being tested every day? No, oh. no, uh, no. But you got COVID about a year ago, right? Yes, yeah, I did, um, and so uh, it was it was very mild for me, um, and my family had light fevers, but uh, yeah, and I, I think that must have been Delta. Um, yeah, looking back at it, so, yeah. yeah. But yeah, but you're you're back playing and you're back skiing, right? Yes, <laughs> that would be yeah. just telling you. <laughs> done quite a bit of skiing over winter break i'm getting my kids into it and uh yeah it's been great to rediscover that um and uh yeah there was some some nice uh snow up in maine uh how old are your kids uh seven and four so it's that age where they're they don't really hurt themselves when they fall and they also look just so ridiculously cute on skis so i'm enjoying that uh while it lasts and you were saying that they're pretty good. Old. Are the boys girls? What's the, what? uh, the girl is four, the boy is seven. Yeah, they took to it really easily. Like they, they want to keep going. They're they kids. Like, yeah, but they, I mean, they, they were out there, you know, four or five hours every day. And, and uh, I also like was too cheap to put them in ski school. So I'm doing it myself. <laughs> so uh, just so, put them at the top of the hill. It's, go. it's going. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, what, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, but, yeah. They'll uh, be able to ski by the time they get to the bottom. That's right. That's yeah. That's right. But you're saying that we're doing black, they're doing black diamonds and stuff. Yeah, he wound up. You know, what we we did many days, so there was a steady progression. And of course, what one place calls a black diamond, another place might call a you know like a blue. So, but he did he did one, and he did it he did it several times and well. So that was nice to see. Like especially, I feel I feel like in the last two years, kids their age have been denied so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and it was nice to just do that. Um, and have it, you know, go well and have the weather comply and, and we didn't get Omicron. And so it was a nice, uh, a nice, clear win, I felt like, for us as a family, which is nice. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bullish on the, on the, we canceled January shows, but I'm bullish on the fact we're going to present in, um, in February. February. We're right in the middle of February. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're reading the East Coast cities, the, the, yeah. the Omicron's dramatically in retreat and the new york times suggested today that that california might have peaked too which is kind of what i'm yeah thinking maybe this is a little earlier than i thought um but i'll take that and then all of we're we're insisting on boosters so of course yeah. and and our our audience is so good they're just great they they've been sending their booster cards in and yeah. um yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that will become a redundancy. Hopefully, we won't need to do yeah. it after this. Well, it's great you've created a sense of confidence, you know, by doing yeah. being careful. So that's important. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's you know, it's and we've got such a nice audience because as I was saying, somebody to somebody yesterday, you know, it, it's not about you or it's not about me. It's about the person next to you. So it's just yeah, exactly. it's just being kind. So yeah. what are you what are you playing up in Seattle? Um, well, I'm playing some. Uh, I'm playing one of the pieces I played for Camerata playing the Waldstein Sonata, which I played uh, for you in uh, November. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're doing two big quintets, Dvorak and Shostakovich. Um, and then I'm playing my the last, I played every Beethoven Violin Sonata except for the G major in Opus 30, so I'm doing that. So now I'll have played all 10 Beethoven Violin Sonatas, which is a nice little um, milestone to hit as a pianist. So are you going to officially turn into a Beethoven piano? Is that, are we just going to have a, like a t-shirt yeah. or something? Because I, yeah, I don't know. Us, you're working through the repertoire. It's true. I don't know what self-respecting pianist as they approach, you know, I'm, I'm 40 and like, I don't know what self-respecting pianist who's been active for a while wouldn't have played a ton of Beethoven, you know, just because of, um, you know, that, that, that incredible, uh, list of repertoire he's left us for various instruments the sonatas cello violin the piano sonatas the, so you, you sort of like it's it's something that you always come back to and it's again a reminder you know it's, it's funny uh that he just sets us up for these basic challenges of musicianship 
um, of organization, of technique, of control, of pulse, of um, it, it's sort of such a ground, uh, I guess, touchstone, right, of, of your of your self awareness as a musician and your capacities. That it's a, uh, you know, I, I, I hope to be playing that stuff till I'm near dead, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, I well, so the piano sonatas, like the string quartets, I think they they give us one of the the, the, the greatest views of his of his evolution as a composer. I think. Mm -hmm. um, the, mm -hmm even more than symphonies or, or yes. other works, but um, yeah. So, yeah, so maybe, maybe, oh, do, do pianists, do you think they go through the same three periods? Do you, in your approach to Beethoven, do you have an early geal, a, late, a middle geal and a late geal? And of course we don't know the late geal yet, hopefully. Oh, you mean in my own personal playing? Um, yeah, you know, I'm starting to, well, in just in a very simple way, and people out there who play an instrument or who teach or have, um, I'm I'm better at being aware of what's happening on stage mm -hmm. than I was when I was in my 20s. Like, in other words, there's what's happening from your perspective and what's happening out there in the hall. Mm -hmm. And those two things actually can have very little to do with one another. Uh, and I think the more experience you gain, the more you can align those things together and be more aware of what's going on. There's also, um, you know, just a, an issue of control where like in the moment of of most technical difficulty and things are going crazy and it's uh, you still keep your cool. Uh, yeah. And I think that um, there's a little bit, you know, we, you want to enjoy the performance and it's really great to stop thinking and just enjoy what's happening and go crazy. But um, there's an ability to step back a little bit in those moments and, and still be aware of what you're doing. And you, you get, you, we get better at that as we get older. Um, the nice thing about piano playing technically, and I might offend some, some other instrument uh, instrumentalists here. Uh, I'm really you, looking forward to what you're going to say now. You can play the piano without deterioration, technically, <clears throat> physically, for a very, very, very long time, and that's that's been proven by by the careers of so many legendary pianists. Yeah. You know, and because unlike a violin, we're not sort of twisted in this um, very unnatural position, and if, if our basic technique is set up in a relaxed way and um, there's there's decades of, of great playing without having to worry about that stuff. Yeah, and wind instruments, of course, wind, your your, oh, yeah. your respiratory system just ages. And absolutely, absolutely. So you know that that's another uh, thing to think about for why you know I think it was Brendel who said that a piano sort of peak years come in the fifties typically if they you know are working very diligently because there is also um, as with everything there's tendency for burnout. You know, like it's like it takes a certain mentality to want to play, it's a little bit like an athlete, I guess, like to want to play at your best level year after year after year to try to push yourself for that. Or do you kind of start thinking, well, I've done that and like I've got other things to do and somebody wants to go skiing this weekend or something, you know, but like um, we definitely make sacrifices for that amount of practice and preparation. Um, so those are all the things that go into, but I, I, I'm feeling pretty, uh, pretty motivated. Um, and that's the key with chamber music too, because you sit down with, somebody next to you who sounds great and you want to match that right yeah. so like that that motivation is 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 built into to chamber music so appassionata um did you play the appassionata in your 20s i played the appassionata when i was like 15. all right so uh, so we're so we're, we're gonna we can we, so not just your 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 uh early middle and late periods as a performer and performance awareness so one has to presume that your teenage appassionata is very different than the one we're going to hear. No. Yeah. And presumably think... when you're playing it in your seventies, there's going to be. You know. Yeah. 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 You know, it's funny. I, I remember the piece. I played it once in Ozawa Hall at Englewood when I was, I was picked to play it there as part of like the Boston University Tanglewood Institute. And mostly I just remember like a massive adrenaline kick um, because the piece itself is so wild and it's so wonderfully dark. Um, and I just remember thinking it was the coolest thing in the world to get to play something like this for people, you know, on a great piano and make all that noise. And, um, and it, it, it was just a physical thrill, you know. And, you know, I didn't understand something about the transform. I, you know, someone had, had, of course, a teacher had mentioned it to me, but the idea of the transformation of the second theme coming out of the first theme and, I wasn't as sensitive to the implications of that. And, 
um, you know, so and and the humor of the second movement and its uh, simplicity, not something that I was particularly attuned to either. Um, but the drama and the technique of it and the challenge, those were all things that as a teenager I was, um, you know, so uh, it was just so appealing. And there was also something um, nihilistic about the piece and, and really destructive that was so in line with my teenage self. Um, you know, that, that it really, I mean, it's just a wild, wild composition, you know, so um, there were a lot of things about it. And there's a reason that it's usually, um, it is learned pretty early on in a pianist development, because it's one of those early pieces that makes you go there um, on stage with this kind of uninhibited, um, extroverted performance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, and what you're talking about, you know, that's, that's teenage, you just described teenage passion. <laughs> Yeah, totally. It's a, a yeah. Blunt, it's a blunt instrument. You know? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then there's yeah. middle age passion, and then I guess there's old age passion. So. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about the piece. So this this we recorded this this was this was a COVID project where um, we we're starting the program. You're, this is the last piece in today's concert at home. We're starting with the we started with the the uh, wreck of the Umbria by Chupinski, which. We did that the week before with Kristen, and we were experimenting with light and with camera techniques. Um, yeah, the, the lighting designer, Jared, said was amazing. So the, the things that we did with this. And, and we're doing some experiments with the passion out of changing colors in between movements. And yep. I don't know if I'll keep that, or, but you know, all yeah. information is, uh, it, it was the exploration, but that was a fun, that was a fun day recording you in Thayer Hall. Uh, tell us a bit the piece. Yeah, so the piece, um, I think something that's striking is how extraordinarily compact and unified it is. Um, there's a, um, a conciseness to it. Um, there's a tautness to it. Um, really, the movements flow really from the beginning of the piece to the very end of the piece. It's one, one complete experience. Um, and there is a obsessive quality to elements of rhythm um, in the first movement, this bop, 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 kind of running through the piece really, really obsessively. Um, even when the music will, I, I mentioned, you know, that the second theme in this piece is, the, is a version of the first theme transformed um, to sound noble instead of incredibly ominous. Um, and that's a, that's a technique that Beethoven uses a lot that I think listeners can focus in on, which is he presents an idea in unison so everything is playing exactly the same pitch and in empty octave so that's one of the reasons the beginning of the piece sounds so threatening it's empty it's kind of barren sounding and then he fills that in um, which are, with a richness of, of harmonization so you can hear that change of, of the kind of uh, tautness of the line getting filled out and getting richer um, it has uh, as is typical of Beethoven's uh, really intense pieces, incredible uh, contrast of dynamic, violence of dynamics throughout um, in the first and third movements. The second movement is very interesting in its ability to sort of clear the composer's throat and provide a moment of, uh, of calm and um, good-natured humor. There's a kind of noble simplicity to it. Uh, and it's very short. And in this period of Beethoven, he's not so interested in writing slow movements, really. I mean, they're, they're almost just me methods of transition. Um, and he's really interested in getting right back to the action, so to speak, with this um, famous sudden diminished chord, almost like uh, glass breaking or shattering something. And then we're right back to this uh, chase to the abyss in the last movement, which uh, has another typical Beethoven quality, which is to write very fast music uh, played quietly with then outbursts. So the, the idea would be that you're holding the lid down on something that's trying to get out. Um, and it sometimes gets out. Uh, and finally, in the coda, it, you know, finally gets out and, and explodes. Um, but that's, um, you know, there's, I think there's something about this style of Beethoven, uh, Waldstein also applied, you know, where anyone can walk into this hall and listen to this or, or tune into this video you don't need any academic information or cultural background really to understand what's happening here because it's so primal and it's techniques you see used in movies and theater in storytelling of any kind what i just talked about where you you contain energy 
it's even kind of physics, right? Or like chemistry, I guess. But like you, you something's going to explode. And, you know, when does it happen, right? So uh, it's it's all about delaying I mean, that. And, and, I, yeah. I think you just, you've just defined middle period Beethoven there in a few words. Something's going to explode. Right, right, <laughs> right. And somehow you can tell, even from the first note to the Appassionata, even though it's it's very quiet music, but it's incredibly menacing, you know? And so it's a little bit that leaving a loaded gun on stage, you know, and like, when is that thing going to be used? Um, so, and again, you know, I was struck going back to the piece, how short it feels, the whole sonata, you know, like it, because it's sort of, once it begins all the way to the end, it's, it's just this one experience. Great introduction. So from June 28th, 2021, Beethoven's uh, Opus 57 Sonata in F minor, uh, the Appassionata Sonata with uh, our friend Shiel. Shiel, thanks so much, man. So thank enjoy you. your concerts up in Seattle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Be well and be, stay healthy.